be here with you all on a little bit, I guess a little bit of a rainy day and it's sure pleasant to see the change in the atmosphere outside. All oh, it's a little muggy out this morning, but uh, can you believe it's seven weeks till the feast though? And that's going to bring on some nicer weather, I believe. And uh, I hope that you're all making your feast plans. We, Judy reminded me this morning that I, we've got to finish our schedules and get them out and get them to print so we'll have time. Everybody has them in, in their hands. And uh, um, thank you, Mark, for your comments. I appreciate you keeping abreast of the things that are there in our news. What I'd like to talk to you today, I want to ask you a question. Is the church thriving? You know, Jesus said that the great the the gates of the grave shall not prevail against the church. And I believe that with all my heart, and I believe you do too. But what about church attendance? You know, for the most part, church attendance in America is down. That's not just in our organization. That's all over. I talked to other, you know, people that are, you know, the First Baptist Church or, you know, maybe the Catholic Church, people that I know in the workplace and you know, the, the church attendance is down in America. And they know that statistically. For the first time, though, they think it's dropped below 50%, like down to 47 or so percent, less than half. And down from the 1990s, which was probably in the you know, upper 60s, lower 70%, in 1937 it was said that 73% of the people attended church. There was a Gallup poll, and I don't take a lot of, you know, <laughs> credence and Gallup polls because you can just about make a poll say just every you know depending on your pollsters I guess but according to them there were 50 uh, should be should say 66 of traditionalists now these are people born before 1946 attend some sort of church or have an affiliation with church and I I couch some of those statistics too because just because someone goes to church on Easter and and Christmas and they consider themselves to be a, a member of a church, really, to me, doesn't <laughs> designate regular attendance like, you know, the Bible tells us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. 58% of baby boomers, that's my age group, between that were born between 1946 and 1964, consider themselves to be affiliated with a church or, or attend church. And, and these, all these numbers are down the... The traditionalists are down by 11%. The baby boomers are down by 9%. Generation X, which is we're born from 1965 to 1980. These are not my terms that I use. They're scientific terms. 50% are associated with a church. And 36% of millennials, which were born between 1981 and 1996. And they call a millennial someone who was reaching their adulthood by the time they, you know, by the turn of the century, the 21st century. And it remains to be seen what Generation Z, it's interesting they use that term. In, in, Generation Z, those are the little kids that haven't reached maturity yet. What their religious affiliation will be or how, how many of them will attend church. What has brought about the decline in church attendance? Why such a drop and such disinterested, you know, in church going. You know, it was always passed down. Everybody went to church. It was always the joke. We always get our, you know, as the movies would portray it, the Sunday go to meet and close, and we'd all go to services, and you'd see the people in even covered wagons, and I don't know how they went down to the old clapboard churches, and I passed one over here in Marshall the other day. Weeds are grown up. It was an old wooden building, and I could just see those people in wagons and horses on a hot summer afternoon and women all their petticoats and everything and the sweat running down off their brow going and listening to some preacher, you know, in a church that had no air conditioning or fans. I, you know, as I said here a couple weeks ago, I don't know how many people would come to church if it was that way today. In 2 Corinthians, the uh, second chapter, I'll just quote this to you. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthian church, writes... Lest, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That really struck a chord with me. This is what I'd like to address today, not only the devices of Satan, you know, and I don't know if you've ever, you're familiar with uh, Sun Tzu. He was the famous Chinese general. He says he wrote a book, and a lot of people in sales will read this book. I had one given to me years ago, and it talks about know your enemy. 
You know your enemy inside and out. You know how many people he has in his army. You know his motives. You know his moves. You know what kind of person he is. What are his background? You really research your enemy, and you'll never be in peril if you have to go up against him because you already know what his moves are. I've read some of these fantastic moves of the men and women in the U.S. military during World War II because they knew that the Japanese were expecting them to advance on this certain position. But some of these generals knew that if we go there, we're going to get obliterated. We're going to, go the, we're going to attack this island from the point they would least expect it, even though it's going to be more treacherous. It's going to be hills and mountains and rocks. That's the way we're going. And it led a lot of times to their success. Know Your Enemy in Pogo, the comic strip from the 1940s, late 40s, said, we have met the enemy and he is us. It was sort of a play on words from a previous statement that was made by someone in the military. Since the turn of what we call the 20th century, our country has made historic changes that I believe may have attributed to the lack of interest in church attendance or even a devout religious life. A sort of blurring of the lines, and I really want to focus or emphasize that word blurring of the lines, has occurred between a godly society and a secular or non-religious lifestyle. I'd like to quote a few of these examples, and these are by no means all the changes in cultures, but these are ones that I have witnessed, some of which I've witnessed in my lifetime, that have come to mind over, over the years. Those that I, some of these that I knew at the time were going to be detrimental to our goal to have a wholesome society. Blurred, as I called it here in my notes, blurred vision of our leadership. To me, one of the very first ones that come to my mind, and you're going to be familiar with these, I just want to remind you, of it's like the proverbial frog in the frying pan. You know, they say he sits there and you turn the heat on real low and he just sits there. If you just turn it on high, he jumps out and lives. But after, and I don't know if this is even true or not, but it's sort of like a, a proverb that if you slowly turn the heat up, that he will just sit there until he completely fries himself, you know, and, and, uh, and, and dies. The change is ever so slowly. In, um, so one of the very first changes that happened in our nation that I believe really attribute to the effects on the people, one of the very first ones that came to my mind was from 1859, of course, I wasn't born yet, was Charles Darwin and the idea of evolution. I think that was a real blow to a society that was dependent upon God as a creator, recognized God as creator by the vast majority, and science sort of became God. It sort of replaced God. And, and the theory, I, in my mind, when I look back and see the writings and read some of the materials there, is that if God is not God, and God is not creator, and we move him out of the way, and now all of a sudden science has all the answers, then I really don't have to do what this God over here tells me to do. I'm not subject to all the things you tell me that I should do that he says. I think that was a tremendous blow. I don't have to obey, obey this non-existent God. And, of course, we know that the Bible tells us, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second one, is, I believe, was something that was written in the Bill of Rights, and it was the separation between church and state. And I'd like to just make a few notes here or make a few comments. Congress, it tells us, shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. You know, that was written on the heels of coming out from under the Anglican Church in Britain and that was holding sway over the people, but also the establishment of a state religion. That was what they were defending themselves against, which had, you know, brought havoc down upon the nations for centuries prior to that, especially through the, Ro the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. You can go back and there are volumes you can read about what happened to those people who were subject to a state religion run by the government and telling people how they're going to believe. That was what they were trying to combat when they wrote our uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, this was written not that religion couldn't influence government. 
The people should be the overruling voice. But the will of the people has been overrun and is being overrun every single day. You know, we witness uh, little care of what the government thinks about what people uh, thoughts are. And, you know, it's becoming less and less. The, the, the will of the people is becoming less and less, I believe. What the people think, believe, or desire is of little concern anymore. But they will take the crowbar of an extreme case over here, way out in, you know, the gray area, as I would call it, and they will use it in the destruction of laws that were meant for the guiding light of the majority. I've seen that in my lifetime. They will take the most extreme case, they'll drag it in front of everybody, and they'll use it to destroy a law that I think was beneficial to our society. You know, Thomas Jefferson in 1802 wrote, and he warned of this wall of separation between government and the church because they were using terms like the separation of the church and state. And Thomas Jefferson, I believe, realized that they were building this brick wall that was going to come back and haunt us someday, that there needed to be some continuity between the two. Of course, lawsuits were filed later on, especially after World War II, and the Bible, uh, the, the Bible reading in the classroom and prayer was abolished from schools as a result of that. They demanded that you describe and, de and define separation between church and state. And so those were laws were results. And of course, this led eventually to the removal of religious symbols in the 1980s, all the way up to the 2005 when the Ten Commandments were considered to be unconstitutional in our state capital here in Texas as well in Kentucky and some of the other earlier ones. Now it's, you know, it's all over, the, all over our nation. The next one I'd like to mention is the feminist movement that began in Europe and especially before the turn of the century and it came in the 1940s, especially when ladies were forced out of the home, out of the duty of a wife and a mother because the men were away working. They were forced into factories and they were made to work. And out of that became abuse. And, you know, I'm not here to, def to defend uh, the rights, I, I mean, to object to the defense of the rights of women, especially when they were being abused. But what came out of that soil, the revolution that changed the family structure is what I wanted to address. No longer was a woman the mother, and it, it was almost as if what erupted out of the 60s and burning your bra and you've come a long way, baby, was it was almost repulsive for a woman to have a position as a wife and a mother. Oh, you need to get out of that environment. You need to go get a job. You need to have a career. You need to have... And that led to the breakdown, the first cracks of the family unit. I, th I thought this morning, isn't it interesting, Satan attacked Eve there in the garden. It was the first one. He picked her, not Adam, to begin to break apart this unit, you know, and I think it was, it's important that we know that. Another one is out of, out of the late 50s and into the 60s, the Declaration of Free Speech was applied to pornography. Go back and look at some of the cases between uh, especially beginning in California, uh, what was once declared obscene. We had laws in our country that determined what was obscene. And it began with people mailing out things in the mail, and people would get these obscene photographs or pictures in the mail, and they had cases of that sort. But it, began, it went from mail to magazine. Of course, you know the Playboy and the Penthouse magazine. They filed a lawsuit declaring that these magazines were, were free speech. And... Uh, and then, of course, that went on to lawsuits about adult movies and blue movies and uh, finally today, where we are today, the Internet, and even up to video games for our little children. They had to determine what's, what they can get away with when they put that in front of our little children today. today. And, that, and, and the right to express explicit images are now acceptable in America. The demoralization of the wholesome relationship between a man and a woman also began to occur because I believe because of what pornography does to the marriage between a man and a wife. 
there were no fault divorce laws that were passed in the late 1960s, about 1969. No longer did a person have to give a reason to have a divorce. They just divorced because, and I, I told you in the past, I like to look, when I watch these black and white movies, I, I like to click over in my, my device that shows me the, the actors' names, when they were born and where they're from. And I find it fascinating. But sometime I'll look them up on the internet and find out that these people have been married four, five, six, seven, eight times. It's like the guy I told me in Dallas one time, getting married is just like changing socks. I mean, that's about the value of a marriage that was to him. The, my point is, though, that these divorce laws made it much easier, even though some will claim that the divorce rate went down in America because of these laws, because now there was no restriction but others claim that it was that the effect that it had on the family unit was disastrous. Then there were the anti-sodomy laws. Now, I won't go into great detail here other than it was repealed, began to be repealed in the 1960s. And, and, and I remember in the 1980s, these were very prevalent, especially during the time of AIDS and sexually transmitted diseases. Did you know that India was one of the countries I read about that even up into the year 2000, sodomy was outlawed and sentenceable by life in prison if you were caught. And, of course, they've gladly overturned that now, so it's okay in, in India now to have sodomy. Intercourse is what the British called that mandate or that law, intercourse against the order of nature. I believe they were absolutely right was punishable by life in prison. But look at us today. We have gay rights. We have the, you know, all of these movements now, the LGBTQ, whatever, like Marx is, XYZ, whatever it might be. Marriage itself has become completely blurred. Immorality now has rights. How about that? Uh, of course, the biggest one that's been in the news lately is Roe versus Wade and how it's been repealed. But you know, legalization of abortion and the right that it was to the soul of our country, a way for to have free sexuality with no consequences uh, of behavior. Add all of these up to globalization, you know, the world conglomeration of economics, of, you know, military secrets to training and hardware that I've seen go overseas to uh, former enemies. I remember the first time I saw the stealth bomber, how they publicized this secret weapon that we had. And the other day I was watching a program about the, they call this the magnetic cannon that can fire a missile. I think it's something like 55,000 feet per second. It can go through multiple layers of, of, of armor because of the speed of this incredible machine. And there they are practically giving me the blueprints of how to build one online, you know, how it works and how it is so successful. Although it may not be a very good military uh, piece of hardware, but what can another country do with it if they use that technology and advance it? The selling of land and businesses and resources and manufacturing to foreign countries uh, the political corruption in our own country, along with treasonous acts, I believe, that have happened here in this last, you know, decade. All this leads to the, for me, it's the inability to digest it all. And the incapability of, the, the feeling of the incapability of making a difference. And so the whole idea, I guess, of hopelessness occurs within people who normally would come to church and have this great feeling of hope. I think all of those things have affected a person's idea that they believe in something and that somehow we make a difference. And they sort of throw the bath, the baby out with the bath water. Well, if all of this is happening and I'm hopeless and I can't do anything about it, what can religion do? They know that there was a heightened sense of Religious fervor in the 70s. We experienced that in the, the Church of God. There were vast numbers of crowds. I remember seeing them as a child. It's a different time now. We've gone through some, and like that old frog that's sitting in the frying pan, we've gone through enormous changes in our country. And some of these, the young people won't even recognize because they were all before they were born. 
Some of the things that I'm mentioning here happened before I was born, and yet they've had an effect. In a world gone mad, I had desperately looking this morning for some encouraging words from my Savior and yours. And I came across John, the 14th chapter, in verse 1. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Now that's hard to do, isn't it? When we read and hear of these and sort of go through this list here, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. I, I just grabbed a hold of those words this morning. Don't be troubled. Here is my Savior telling me, don't be troubled. And I'm reading his words for you that today. Verse 6, he says, I am the way. Remember he said on one occasion, enter you into the straight gate, for narrow is the way that leads to, or broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Choose me. No man comes, to, comes unto me but by, unto the Father but by me. Down in verse 12, Verily I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. So there is some promise here that at some point you may be given similar responsibility or similar power that he was able to exercise. He said, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. It's almost like a promise that someday all of this is going to be straightened out and you're going to have a great life ahead. In verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I did a sermon here recently about the Ten Commandments. Uh, he goes on here. I want to elaborate. I wanted to read three chapters here, but you know that's impossible to do in a sermon. But he goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit and how it was going to give us courage. And it was going to, you know, he, he described the Holy Spirit as the divine indwelling of the nature of God that we have when, we're, when we repent, we're baptized, and we receive God's Holy Spirit. God actually comes in and lives with us. His nature actually comes into our heart. I guess if we didn't have that, we wouldn't really care what the world is doing out here. We'd just go along and live our life and just hang it all, you know, every man for himself. I'll just take care of me, and that's all that's important. But when you have God's Holy Spirit in you, you see the contrast, and it's troubling to you. It's something that you want to, you feel the need to try to correct. At least I do. Verse 21, he that has my commandments and keeps him, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will make myself known to him. I will make myself manifest to him. You will see me, is what he is essentially saying here. Face to face, like the Apostle Paul said. We look through a glass darkly, but then face to face, we shall see him as he is. That's a promise that he gives us. In John, the 15th chapter, down in verse 10, I'm going to skip ahead. You can go back and read through these. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These are fantastic promises. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. In other words, these are things that's going to bring joy. These are things that are supposed to Give us happiness. Bring us happiness. Make us happy. It's hard to be happy in a crazy world, isn't it? But we're supposed to have joy in our hearts, in our minds, in our soul. We're supposed to have a great outlook and know that we're like, the, we're like a flickering flame that's burning out here in a world of darkness. We have the brightest hope, the greatest joy of knowing that we have a, an enormous future. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Uh, down in verse 13, Greater love is no man than this, than a, than a man lay down his life for his friends, his comrades, his, his fellows. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. 
Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servants know not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And again, those are, those are very, very powerful words from Jesus Christ who looks down at your life here in the 21st century on this Sabbath day and he knows every hair of your head. He knows who you are. He knows the problems you face. And he realizes the troubles that you have to go through. He knows about the temptations that you have. He knows about the sins that you're having to deal with. And he still loves us. He still cares for us. And he says that he's going to call us friends, that he's that he has chosen us and ordained you that you should go forth and bring fruit and that your fruit should remain. That so that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So there's going to come a moment when whatever your desires are, whatever you ask, God is going to fulfill those promises, those requests that you have. Down in verse 18. There will, however, be hatred from the world. Jesus is warning us here. He's warning his disciples. He says, look at verse 18. Uh, well, let's, um, let's see here. Let me get to the right scripture here. Down in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He's almost saying, expect it. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In Luke, uh, I, I wrote a reference here in my margin, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Remember Jesus warned that. Woe unto you if everybody thinks you're a good old boy, you're, just, you're going right along with the crowd here. But he says the world is going to hate you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If, that, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If, if, they have kept not, uh, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. In other words, not only do they reject me, and they will reject you, they reject God the Father. They reject any authority over them. And look what it says. Um, <clears throat> if I had not come, oh, I want to skip down here to uh, uh, verse uh, chapter 16. This is sort of goes, this thought continues right on into chapter 16. It doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. This chapter break is put in there. He said, these things I've spoken unto you that you should not be offended, that you don't stumble. Don't get caught up. Don't, don't get trapped. They shall put you out of the synagogue, yea, the time comes that, they, that whosoever kills you will think they do God a service in their righteous, you know, self-righteous acts. They're going to think they're doing God a service, and that's just unbelievable. You know, it's, it's heinous what they would do. But these things I have told you down in verse 4, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I have told you of them. That's like, not only is this a warning, but Jesus, not only warning of persecution, but he wants us to know that he told us that it would be this way. It was going to happen. And that way, if it comes along, you won't think, well, God's just deserted us and left us all out here by ourselves. No, it's something that's going to happen, unfortunately, as a result of the decisions we've made in our history. And down in verse 22, I want to skip, that, skip ahead a little bit here. And you, know, and you now therefore have sorrow. That's what I feel sometimes when I see, you know, read the headlines and read the news and see the crazy decisions that were continuing being made by our country and our government. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. You know, that is a, a good feeling to think that you're going to be standing there, there that day when Jesus returns, and he's going to, you're going to see him. Now, I've thought about that. How, do you, how, do you, how are you going to feel that, that moment? Have you ever just contemplated what that moment will be like? That's him. 
There he is. There he is. There's the one that we have read about, thought about, you know, read all these prophecies and scriptures about, but there he actually is. Uh, what he will look like, what, how he will manifest himself to us. Will he still have the scars in his hand and the stab wound in his side to prove that he is who he said he is? I, I, I don't know what that, I, I, I can't describe what I will feel, what will be going through my mind. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Uh, verse 25. These things I have spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time will come when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly the Father. In other words, not only will we see him, there will come a time when he will actually reveal to us the Father. Now that is an ultimate high of reward uh, promise that he's given us. In Jude, the fifth chapter, I'm going to change gears here a little bit here and read just the last of these scriptures here. Jude, the fifth chapter. You know where I'm going with this. If you've remember, ever read the book of Jude, Jude talked about warning the people. I mean, he, he warned the people, the church that was in uh, the New Testament there. Jude, uh, I say Jude, the fifth chapter. You know there's only one chapter in Jude, right? I was just testing you to see if you were uh, still awake after all of that. Jude, the fifth verse, he says, I will therefore put you in remembrance that you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And, of course, he goes on to talk about the angels that left their first estate and left their own habitation, hath he reserved into everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. In other words, these angels that rebelled against God, God is reserved for destruction. He's going to pour out his wrath upon them at some point in time. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner are giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That city, those cities, that whole plain there was involved in that activity that's absolutely condemned in the book of Leviticus and in the book of uh, chapter, first chapters of the book of Romans, where it says they got, you know, they received them in them the the recompense for their activity. But God rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah and made it an eternal example to everyone that would act that way or a city that would conduct uh, that kind of activity. Likewise, these filthy dreamers, I want to skip down though to verse 14. Uh, verse 13, raving waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all of their ungodly, uh, that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And we go now to Revelation, the sixth chapter, and we can look at the result of this. You know, I don't want to really belabor this other than just mention this as a warning, but also as hope for the people of God and those that might be turned off at church and turned off at religion because they don't think it has any answers. Look what God's Word says. Revelation, the sixth chapter, down in verse 12. And I beheld, and they opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. This is immediately, as Jesus tells us in Revelation, uh, Matthew 24, chapter, the heavenly signs that are going to startle the world. I mean, will the sun really stop shining? That's what the implication is here, that you talk about stopping human activity. Now, if the good old sun quits coming up in the morning and it's pitch black outside, you think that won't get some attention? And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, even as a fig cast her untimely figs, when she's shaken of a mighty wind, like big, huge, you know, meteor shower. And the heavens departed as a scroll 
I don't even know what this is talking about. If I understand heaven goes on forever and ever and ever, but somehow the display that I'm seeing up there in the sky is telling me that the heavens are opening it up and something is coming out of wherever that is, out of the ether out there as a scientist describe it. Somewhere out there in the universe, God is going to break the glass that separates us and he's going to enter into our realm. And everybody's going to see it, the whole earth. He says, every mountain and every island shall be moved out of place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the captains and the mighty men, every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens of the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from his wrath. It's funny. All of a sudden, now there's a God again. Once they got rid of him, now they're saying, let's hide from him. It's, it's interesting how quick human beings can change their rotten minds. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to abide? You know, Peter wrote, if judgment begins at the house of God, what will the end of the ungodly and the sinner be? There is coming a time when God is going to pour out his wrath. I'm going to read these other scriptures talk in Revelation the 19th to the 20th chapter talking about the bloodshed and, and the absolute, not only the destruction of every person that's evil, wicked, rotten, that defies God, but also ultimately the angels that defied him and Satan himself will be cast into a lake of fire. Total destruction. I don't know what that means for a spirit being that's got to be symbolic. Maybe God is going to cast him so far out in the universe that he will never be able to uh, disrupt a human being again. I know we've come through a great many transformations in our country. It is a result of our people slowly turning away from the principles of God. But it's also the devices of Satan that means to destroy our country and root out our sacred people. We cannot let this deter us from our mission of preaching the gospel message and holding the hands of Moses in support of the word of God. Don't slack. Don't fall away. Don't despair. I didn't go back and read 2 Thessalonians where it talked about, you know, that you know, there's going to be a great turning, a, a falling away from the truth of God. Place your faith in God and in Jesus Christ. He will be here shortly, and he will put down all the evil accomplishments of this world and all their rotten laws and set things right once again. It says in Isaiah that the law shall go forth out of Zion, and one of the very first pronouncements that he makes is going to look like, the Bible describes that his mouth is like a double-edged sword that it goes out and slays the wicked by his righteous commands that he gives. That is our joy, that's our motivation, and that is how we will carry on.